NTU effectiveness method for heat exchangers is weird. By comparison, LMTD, log mean temperature difference, is really straightforward and easy to understand, but number of transfer units, again, the only way I can describe it is that it's weird. I'm gonna work through an example problem with a counterflow double pipe heat exchanger, and instead of doing kind of a lecture at the beginning, then an example problem, I'm just gonna explain all the terms sort of as we go. But to start off, the way that I recognize that this is an NTU, number of transfer units problem, and not an LMTD problem, is that we don't know exit temperatures. NTU effectiveness is used when you're trying to decide what heat exchanger to buy. Like you have your system, you know your cold inlet temperature and your hot inlet temperature, um, and you have your mass flow rates, but you don't know what outlet temperatures are gonna be. You want to find that out. And say for different models of heat exchangers, you know UA for one exchanger and you know UA for a different heat exchanger. You're trying to figure out which one to buy and what the exit temperatures are gonna be might influence your decision. Because you might have some temperature limitation. You don't want your cold to rise above some threshold or you don't want your hot to drop below some threshold. So for this example problem, we've got mass flow rates, inlet temperatures, and specific heat values for both the hot flow and the cold flow, which are flowing in opposite directions. We've got the overall heat transfer coefficient U and the surface area of this uh, unit. And we're trying to find the rate of heat transfer, the exit temperatures for both flows, and just a little kind of added step at the end. If the heat transfer coefficient were later on to eventually drop to half from 1000 out of 500, what level of fouling would it take to cause that type of drop? So since exit temperatures are unknown, this is an NTU number of transfer units problem and effectiveness NTU method problem. And I'm gonna make a couple of assumptions. First being that H is constant. So the effectiveness NTU method is basically requires the heat exchanger to be kind of small so that H can be constant because H would change over the course, if it's for a really large system, you would not expect H to be the same at every point in the system. So I'll start off by just grabbing the effectiveness equation where E is Q dot divided by Q dot max. This is coming straight from the FE reference manual here and, and Q dot is the term that we're looking for. So basically you're gonna have to try to solve for effectiveness and also Q dot max. Well, what is the maximum rate of heat transfer? So that's gonna be M dot CP delta T is usually what we think of for the rate of heat transfer for a single fluid flow, which compared the outlet temperature versus the inlet temperature. But what is the maximum possible change in temperature? And in this case, it's gonna be T hot in minus T cold in. And this is where it actually starts looking like UA delta T, right? That's another version of heat transfer is UA delta T is equal to Q dot. And in that case, the, the delta T's are the two different temperatures compared to each other from two different flows. But what I want you to imagine is, suppose that the cold flow just stayed at the exact same temperature. So for this problem, assume that 20 degrees never changed. So then what would be the maximum amount of drop that the hot flow, the 100 degrees, the maximum amount of temperature it could lose, and the max would be 80. It could only go from 100 down to 20. It could never drop below the cold temperature. So the maximum amount of temperature change for the hot flow is from 100 all the way down to 20, as if the cold, temp cold flow never heated up. And the same thing for the cold flow. If the hot temperature always stayed at 100, the cold flow at 20 could only rise up to 100. It could never go above that. So this T hot in minus T cold in is not comparing the hot to the cold flows. It's actually saying that the hot can only go as low as the cold and the cold can only go up to the hot. So that for this problem, 80 degrees is the maximum change in temperature that either flow could have. And so then this front term, M dot CP, the maximum amount of heat transfer will actually be M dot CP for whichever is lower. And the reason that this is, is that whichever M dot CP is lower is the one that will change temperature more. And this value M dot CP is 
capital C, the heat capacity rate. And the heat capacity rate is a ratio between power and temperature. So the amount, so the rate of heat being added versus change in degrees. And whichever one has a lower heat capacity rate will change temperature faster. That sounds a little backwards because rate kind of sounds like speed, like a higher rate should be a faster speed, but it's actually a measure of like how much energy it takes to change temperature, right? Like specific heat capacity, a very high heat capacity means it takes a lot of heat to change by one degree. So same thing for this heat capacity rate, capital C, still means that a lot of energy is required if the value is big to change by a degree. So the smaller heat capacity rate takes a smaller amount of heat to change temperatures. So whichever is the smaller heat capacity rate will change by that full 80 degrees sooner before the other one would. And so this system could never have a higher Q dot max than this C min, the minimum of CH or C cold, whichever of those is lower, C min times delta T, that'll be Q dot max. And for this problem, we get that C hot is 10,470 and the cold C is 20,890. So this means our minimum value for C is gonna be C hot, the 10,470. The hot fluid is going to change temperatures faster. So it is going to be the determining uh, fluid flow for the maximum rate of heat transfer. I warned you that this was super weird. Now at this point, we can move forward to find the effectiveness. And the effectiveness is gonna be essentially a percentage between zero and one as to how close to this maximum heat transfer rate we're actually gonna get. And so for this counterflow heat exchanger, I again can just look up in the FE reference manual, there's just an equation. So one minus E to the negative NTU, the, all the rest of it, it's on your screen here. So there's two things that I still haven't found yet in here, NTU, right, number of transfer units, and CR, the capacity ratio, heat capacity ratio. So NTU is uh, UA divided by M dot CP. And in particular, we want the minimum value for M dot CP. So this is the minimum capital C, right? This is the lower value of those two. So for our problem, 1000 times 23 divided by 10,470, so 2.197 NTU number of transfer units. So NTU is not a percentage. In fact, it can be values less than one or greater than one, but a larger value for NTU means more heat transfer. A smaller value for NTU is less heat transfer. So consider the two main equations you use for rate of heat transfer, M dot CP delta T and UA delta T. Now those delta T terms are different. M dot CP delta T, the delta T is for a single stream and UA delta T, it's the difference between two temperatures, like between two streams. But the front part, the UA and the M dot, C, the M dot CP and the UA, so NTU is a ratio between those two sort of front terms, the UA and the M dot CP, that helps to explain how much heat actually will be flowing, both based on the design of the heat exchanger itself and based on the fluids. So a larger heat exchanger for A or a higher U, overall heat transfer coefficient, U and A both make a more effective heat exchanger. A more effective heat exchanger will be a larger value for NTU, which will get us closer to 100% effectiveness. Now in the denominator, M dot CP, a very high mass flow rate means that the water is gonna be going through very quickly, meaning it's not gonna have enough time to actually heat up to get that full delta T, the full change in temperature, which means that we are gonna be at the lower effectiveness. We're gonna be less 
of that maximum rate of heat transfer. Same with CP. If CP is very large, this means that it takes a large amount of heat to change a single degree, which means, again, we're gonna have a harder time reaching that maximum rate of heat transfer. So UA in the numerator, these are things that make larger changes in temperature, more heat to transfer, and the things in the denominator are things that, when mass flow rate and CP are larger, are gonna result in smaller changes in temperature and less heat transfer. And in general terms, an NTU less than one is pretty small, and an NTU around four or five is very big. So this value that we're getting here of 2.197 is kind of in the middle. CR, the heat capacity ratio, is just a ratio of the heat capacity. So M dot CP divided by M dot CP, the smaller one divided by the larger one. So 10,000 divided by 20,000, we're 0 0.5012. And the reason that we need this capacity ratio is that in theory, that maximum change in temperature can only be reached if one of the streams is not changing temperature at all. But if the hot is cooling and the cold one is warming, then we definitely cannot get there. And so both of the M dot CP terms are actually relevant in figuring out basically how much any one stream can change because however much the other stream changes, that subtracts from how much the first one can change. So plug these numbers into this big exponential and I get epsilon effectiveness of 0 0.7998 via this equation. And I can check and make sure that I didn't make a calculator mistake because uh, probably every textbook has figures that you can use for this as well. So if I pull up my figure from my textbook for the counterflow double pipe heat exchanger using my NTU of 2.2, and a CR of 0 0.5. When I look at this figure, it looks like an effectiveness about 0 0.78. And that's very close to the number I got with the equation. So I'll put a, a check mark there. Um, I'm still gonna use 0.7998 uh, in the rest of this problem, but checking the figure is a good way to make sure I didn't make a calculator error. I can now go back to the very first equation I wrote. Effectiveness is equal to Q dot divided by Q dot max. So my Q dot is effectiveness times Q dot max. My effectiveness 0.7998, about 80% effective. The maximum rate of heat transfer is with my uh, minimum value for C, the 10,470. And then the maximum delta T, the 100 minus 20. This gives me 669,900 watts which is pretty high, right? Again, we're about 80% of the maximum possible rate of heat transfer. And that should kind of be expected because we had a, a medium to large value for NTU and counterflow double pipe heat exchangers are the most effective design. Parallel flow heat exchangers would be expected to be a lot lower and things like shell and tube or cross flow would be somewhere in between the two. To get exit temperatures, I can now use this value for Q along with M dot CP delta T, or since we already calculated M dot CP as just C, the heat capacity rate. So for the hot flow, Q dot is equal to CH, and then the change in temperature T hot in minus T hot out. So the 669,900 for Q dot, 10,470 for heat capacity rate, CH, and then 100 minus T hot gives me a T hot out of 36 degrees Celsius. That's a big drop in temperature from 100 all the way down to 36, right? That did get pretty close. We, we said that the maximum possible change was if it went from 100 all the way down to 20, and it got pretty close to it, right? It dropped down there a pretty, pretty good amount. So for the cold, we can use the same process, 669, 900 for Q dot. Uh, the CC, the heat capacity rate for the cold fluid, uh, 2890. And then the change in temperature of cold, T cold out minus the T cold in of 20. And solving it, T cold out 52.07 degrees Celsius. And at first, don't panic, right? That the cold outlet is actually higher 
than the hot outlet. That would be impossible in a parallel flow heat exchanger, but in a counter flow heat exchanger, that is possible because at the cold outlet, it's being compared against the hot inlet. So that 52 degrees temperature is being warmed by the 100 degrees inlet for the hot in. And at the other end, the cold in is 20. That's where it's being compared to the hot outlet of 36. So the hot is always hotter than the cold. It just works out that that's kind of one of the advantages of counterflow heat exchangers is that the cold outlet can be higher than the hot outlet. A quick double check to see if these temperatures even make sense and are realistic. Delta T hot was 64 degrees. Delta T cold was only 32 degrees. And that checks with what we expected. We expected the hot temperature to change by about twice as much as the cold temperature because C hot was half as much as C cold. When C cold is double, this means it takes double the energy to change the same temperature. So if the hot fluid takes half the energy to change temperature, it should change twice as much. And even though that would have been a perfect ending for a perfectly good problem, because I'm evil, we're going another step further and we're gonna learn a little bit about fouling factor also. So how much of a fouling factor would it take to reduce the overall heat transfer rate from 1000 down to 500? So fouling factor, uh, you can find that as uh, one over UA. So this is sort of how you find the overall heat transfer coefficient. It's like one over UA is equal to like one over HA, basically all of your thermal resistances. So going from like the cold fluid to the pipe and then through the pipe and then from the pipe to the hot fluid, right? All those thermal resistances. So at the very beginning of this problem, we've got one over UA is equal to like one over HA, like all that stuff, all those thermal resistances. But now we're saying that we've added another thermal resistance. So here I'm writing equation two is still one over UA is equal to all the thermal resistances we started with plus R over A. This extra fouling factor term is an extra thermal resistance. So now as a little trick of algebra, I'm gonna take this fouling factor R over A and subtract it to the other side. So one over U2A minus R over A is equal to this stuff, right? All of your thermal resistances. And we said at the beginning, one over UA, the original one over UA was also equal to all that stuff. So I can combine those and I can ignore all of the original thermal resistances and just say that one over UA originally has to equal one over the new UA minus the fouling. And since there's an A in the denominator, we can cancel out all of these A's. So that allows us to solve for R as just the final one over U minus the original one over U. So one over 500 minus one over a thousand, we get a fouling factor of 0 0.001 meter squared Kelvin per watt. Even at the end, I still say that effectiveness NTU method is super weird. There's a lot of new terminology thrown at you. So if you don't quite get it still, I think repetition will help. So here's another video, this time with a shell and tube heat exchanger, where I think if you go through it a second time, it'll make a lot more sense than the first time because it won't be totally new anymore.